seat. All right, welcome back to our study about God's use of Moses to lead his people and rescue his people out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt, and through the Red Sea and off. Now, we're going to be trying to cover the first 16 chapters of Exodus. I'm getting a little antsy about that because um, there's so much more that I want to be saying, and I find myself um, thinking, can I... Do, do I just add? Do I add? So I don't know. Or do, I, or do we just get to the Red Sea and be like, we'll see what happens next year. You know, I don't know. I don't, but, but we're having a good time, and I, I'm hoping you're enjoying this series. It's an incredible moment. It's, it's the moment that God makes a great name for himself. It's like this moment where, where for centuries it's like, okay, God showed himself, revealed himself in this powerful, powerful way. And, and other nations are like, oh, yeah, God did this to the Egyptians and, and all that. We're looking through the eyes of the Bible as we go through this series. Um, Also, we've been enjoying a little bit of the historians and the archaeologists as we've specifically been focusing on Egypt, which we will get back to next week. We actually get back to Egypt in our study next week. Currently today, we're still in Midian, and and that's where we're going to be picking up today. Now, we are now looking at today the easiest to skip passage uh, in in early Exodus. Uh, Definitely the easiest to skip. And and the reason for that is because um, on the one side of this passage, you have this incredible God and Moses moment. You know, that kind of like me and God time, right? Where, Where there's this burning bush and take off your sandals you're on holy ground and it's it's one of those like just incredible wow moments god what is your name my name is yahweh this is the name forever and 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 and, um um and you know here do this thing like go rescue all my millions of people out of slavery and 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 do that you know, but, but there, that amazing God moment, right? And so you've got that spectacular thing. And then on the other side, you've got God's unleashing of his glory and his power and his destruction on the Egyptians to, to bring about releasing people, this great contest between Moses and Pharaoh. I'm giving it all away, but it's there, trust me. And, and you've got this big thing going on. And then right in the middle is like the journey between um, going from Midian to, to Egypt. And, 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 like, you just want to look at that and be like, okay, we're going to skip this. We're, we, we should just skip over this because, you know, it's just journeying. If it, was, if it was just journeying, it wouldn't be in the book. They wouldn't have put this down there. There's actually something so significant in this passage. In fact, it's the kind of thing that we are in life today prone to skipping. We like the big God, wow, and me moments, and then the big, wow, God, through me moments, right? Doing this amazing, God, that was so great what we did right there. That was amazing. And, oh, wow, this was a powerful moment. But it's those in-between times that we're talking about today where God wants to do some stuff here between, between there and there. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. And, and at the heart of this all is I believe reawakening, I say this all the time, begins here. I believe that God's reawakening work in a city, in a nation, in a generation begins right here. And before God do, does big things through you, sometimes he wants to address big things in you. Or maybe things that need to be addressed inside. Before God is going to do this big stuff through Moses in, in Egypt, he's going to do some stuff in Moses and confront him about some stuff. It's so easy to skip that in life, though. We want to get to the cool stuff, the big stuff, the wow stuff. When God's like, mm, let's work on the heart stuff. Let's, let's just stop before we get going any further and address this. Now, I mean, that's the pattern I see in my life, probably the pattern you see in your life. Um, God wants to do something in me, and then he works maybe something through me, and then in, and then through me, and, uh, and, and kind of back and forth like that. Maybe he's calling me at one particular time to better obedience. Brian, you're a little bit slack in this area. Or, or maybe a more willing attitude. Brian, you're, you're a little bit resistant here. Or, or maybe, Brian, I want you to die to your preferences here because I've got a plan. Or trusting and surrender moments uh, about different things. And so he works on those kind of hard things. And then, and then we take another life sto- step forward, uh, God and I. And, and you probably have a very similar story like that, where there's heart moments along the way, and then we move forward. Heart tests, heart tests, heart checks, and then we move forward. 
The first heart check in Moses' story here kind of it taps into last week. And so I'll just kind of use it by way of re reminding ourselves where we left off. So we, after, the, after Moses um, finds out what God's name is and God reveals his name is Yahweh, it means I am who I am, um, then God goes and tells Moses some very specific directions and, and gives him some confidence. Okay, you know, throw your s staff down. Ha, <laughs> didn't tell you it was going to be a snake. Uh, now pick it up. You know, that, that, kind of, that kind of stuff back and forth. And, and, and then um, he gives, he, he, at the end of all of this, Moses is like, mm, I don't want to do this. You know, please send someone else. And God gets angry, right? And, and ultimately, in, in his anger, you know, he's like, okay, well, how about your brother? Maybe the two of you can work together. Not that brothers are great at that, but maybe the two of you can work together and, and go, about this, go about this process. Actually, you know, that's not true. Brothers, brothers can be great, you know, brothers. So you've got this, this going on and, and, and that background moment to this story today. Now, when we cross into this next verse, the first verse here, Moses is in obedient mode. He's moved past that resistance mode. But I want to highlight something before we get into obedient mode. Yes, Moses is going to obey. Uh, he's going to do what God tells him to do. It's going to be incredible. But he, he starts off with that bad attitude and, and that resistant attitude. And I just want to say that obedience, it's a big deal to God. Obedience is big. But you know what he loves even more than obe obedience? Willing obedience. Uh, eager obedience. Uh, when, when God looks at David, King David, he says, this is a man who has my heart. He, he's a man after my heart. This guy, uh, is, his heart is like what I'm, I'm looking for. And what does David write in Psalm 40, verse 8? He says, I delight to do your will, O God. That's what David writes. I delight to do your will. That is very different, different than Moses. Please send someone else. It's, I, I delight to do. Have you ever asked someone to help you? Um, maybe, maybe, you know, like, I'm going to move. Uh, I, I'm going to move house, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, if I can get some friends to help me. Friends? <laughs> to help me move? Um, and, and, the, and their I initial attitude tends to say a lot, right? Oh, movers aren't that expensive. Or, um, you know, ah, my, my elbow, I mean, my elbow, you know, or something like that. Like, uh, and, you get, and, and maybe they come around, they usually do because, you know, they're friends. Uh, and so um, at least the first couple moves, and, and then you get them on board, and it, but it's not quite the same. What you'd really love is an enthusiastic, yes, I'm happy to help you. I am not joking. I got a text today after preaching this in the morning service. Wade Thompson Wade Thompson, hey, this is happening, he, he's moving, uh, 11.34 a.m. today, can you help us move, question <laughs> mark, um, 90 minutes later, uh, enthusiastically yes, both times, block Wade. <laughs> Block Wade. <laughs> Don't let him contact you. You know what's happening. Uh, anyways, yes, uh, people want, though, that, that enthusiastic, that enthusiastic heart response, and so does God. You know, it just makes a difference. It's obedience, but like, yes, enthusiastic uh, obedience. Uh, the first heart check question that we can ask ourselves when it comes to assessing where we're at be between us and God before taking that next step forward with God is the first question is, does my heart delight in obeying God? God in everything. Does my heart delight in it? And this is not easy to do at all. At all. To, to have that posture with God. God, whatever you want me to do, I'm not just willing to do it. I'm willing to do it with joy. I joyfully will embrace. I will delight. I, it is going to be my heart's delight to do whatever you want me to do, no matter how much of myself I have to lay down or surrender or put to death. I, I am, I'm eager to do your will. Uh, God's looking for people like that. Second Chronicles. Um, maybe this isn't the best use of this verse, but that's one of my favorite verses. The, the eyes of the Lord, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. Search throughout or roam throughout or range throughout the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him, who are fully committed. God, what do you want me to do? Anything. I will do it eagerly. Part of the reawakening work that God wants to be done in all of our hearts is, is moving from 
eventual obedience to eager obedience. And that's a big shift from eventual obedience to eager obedience. How are we doing with that? That's, that's, a, that's a heart shift question which we're kind of remembering. Mm, at first, Moses wasn't there. Moses wasn't there. He was happy with his life as it was and wasn't looking to, to move out of there anytime soon. All right, with that background, let's, let's dive into our passage today. I'm going to pick up in verse 18, which is the very next verse after where we left off last week. God had just stopped talking, uh, and there's an end quote, a full stop and an end quote. And then we pick up in chapter 4 of Exodus, starting in verse 18, and it says this. Then, so he's been given all this direction, like a lot of it. Then Moses went back to his father-in-law Jethro and said to him, Please let me return to my relatives in Egypt and see if they are still living. Remember, average life expectancy, 30 years old. It's been 40 years. It's actually quite remarkable that Aaron and Miriam, his brother and sister, are still alive. Aaron's about three years older than him, so Aaron is about 83 years old right now. Miriam's about five to six years older, about 85, 86. I mean, I'm not good with math, but that's, that's, uh, that's simple stuff. Uh, not all, even though I talked about the average life expectancy, depending on your, mm, it's not a career choice, uh, your, your slave task, like a job, I, I don't know how it works. Uh, you know, th there were people who lived normal life expectancies and long life expectancies, um, and Aaron and Miriam apparently were not uh, hard laborers out there in the brick making business, apparently. Something like that. So, um, wow. So, please, let me return to my relatives and see if they are still living. Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. Now, in Midian, the Lord told Moses, return to Egypt. Now, I'm just going to give you some heads up here. A lot of what we're going to be looking at right here is setting up the most bizarre paragraph, the most bizarre story in, in this whole section. It's weird. And, and you get to this section and you're like, I, what is this about? Well, these, what I'm reading right now, these paragraphs, they're going to be telling us what, what it's about because it, it's setting it up. But anyways, uh, now in Midian, the Lord told, Mo told Moses, return to Egypt, for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took God's staff in his hands. Okay. The Lord instructed Moses. Okay, we've already heard all this. There's, there's not going to be new stuff in this paragraph. This is setting up the explanation for, for, for what's about to happen in the weird paragraph coming up. The Lord instructed Moses, when you go back to Egypt, make sure you do before Pharaoh all the wonders I've put within your power. Okay. But I will harden his heart so that he won't let the people go. All right. And you will say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord Yahweh says, Israel is my firstborn. I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me. But you refused to let him go. Look, I am about to kill your firstborn son. Now the strange story. Verse 24. On the trip at an overnight campsite, it happened that the Lord confronted him and intended to put him to death. So Zipporah, his wife, took, or, or Moses' his wife, took a flint cut off her son's foreskin, threw it at his feet. The word is his. Moses is just added, uh, but the word is his. Threw it at his feet and said, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. At, uh, probably God. So he let him alone. At that time, she said, you are a bridegroom of blood, referring to the circumcision. Okay, again, this is the very easy to skip section, right? This is that, Brian, why are we going to spend time talking about this, this moment? And the answer is because reawakening begins here. Reawakening begins here. Before God's going to use Moses, there's a stop along the way, which has some important but easy to skip lessons. And the f there's three components that I want to use to expand 
uh, on this. The first component has to do with circumcision. Yes, I know more about Middle East circumcision, African circumcision, South Pacific ancient circumcision than, than I want to know. I want to do a brain flush after this, this, this day, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be cruel and, and let you in on some of the information in my head, but I will filter. I will try and make sure that there's no jokes. Uh, definitely no diagrams, pictures, or graphs. Okay, nothing along those lines. But there, there's a few things that I want you to know about circumcision because, uh, as Christian, maybe you grew up with this idea that only, Abraham, only the Jewish people were circumcised and everybody else thought it was weird or strange or, or it didn't have anything to do with it. And so the reason that Moses' son isn't circumcised is because nobody else was circumcised, only the Jewish people. That's not actually true. Uh, there was a lot. Almost all the cultures and people groups in this area practiced circumcision uh, at that time, kind of in that mm, Middle East area from, let's say, the Holy Lands down uh, into Arabia and all that kind of stuff. And the reason, uh, one of the reasons why is because most of those nations were genetically descendant of Mo uh, Abraham, of Abraham, right? So Abraham has two kids, Isaac and, uh, nope. Uh, Jacob, and, no, Isaac, yes, Isaac and Ishmael, I Ishmael and Isaac, right? What? Wow, I should start reading this book sometime, it's, <laughs> it's amazing what's in this book. Uh, so yeah, and so, but then he has, it's Sarah, his wife dies, and then he gets married to a, another, uh, his second wife, uh, Keturah, and she uh, has several other kids, one of her kids' name is Midian. And so we are in Midian now, one descendant from there. So all these, all these um, Midian, the son, would have been circumcised, and, and Ishmael was circumcised, and all the other kids. And so their cultures and their, their descendants had some form of circumcision, often with some differences. Um, less cutting and different timings. So like sometimes you would you get, one culture would be like, okay, we're going to be circumcised when we, when we become an adult. Uh, welcome to adulthood. Uh, other times, it's like, okay, a few weeks before your wedding, which, you know, maybe that's why men seem to wait longer to get married back, back then. <laughs> and I don't know. Like, th there's, there's different timings and all that kind of stuff in different cultures. But it wasn't just the Abraham's descendants. This was also taking place in Egypt, not the descendants. So the priesthood and the nobility had circumcision practices in Egypt. Uh, in Egypt, thing, people that, you know, Moses was connected to being raised in Egyptian nobility. So let me see, is there anything else that I can say about that that I want to say? I think I'm more than enough said. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah. So the Jewish people, they were the earliest, you know, eight days and more. Circus, that's more. That was fun. Second, the second thing I want to say uh, about this, setting up this context, is... Uh, the context that I tried to highlight as we were reading it through is that God is telling Moses that he is going to kill Pharaoh's firstborn son. A and we've already been told that, but this is, this is helping us set up this bizarre story. And the reason that, that Pharaoh's firstborn son is going to die is because of Pharaoh's disobedience, because God has commanded Pharaoh to let his son go. To let, to let Israel go, to let his people go. That is a command from God that because Pharaoh is disobeying that command, God's going to kill his firstborn son. And, and this is the key, guys. This is the key of this bit. Because before, before God is going to use Moses to confront the sin of disobedience in Pharaoh, leading to the death of Pharaoh's firstborn son, God is going to confront Moses about his disobedience, threatening the death of Moses' firstborn son. That's what's going on. That's, that's, the, that's the key of understanding what's going on. Reawakening begins here. So does God's discipline. And that's not an Old Testament thing only. That's a New Testament thing. Peter writes about this. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, he says, in verse 17, he says, For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel? Before God's going to use Moses, before God's going to use us, 
before God's going to use us to call out sin and disobedience in other people. Before he's going to use us to call out the sin and evil in our city or in our nation or our generation or, or in our world, he's going to want to call it out in us. In us. Me. He's going to call it out in you. And, and about these areas of disobedience in our lives, uh, you, could, you could look at the teaching of Jesus. Jesus is like, okay, before you go out and, and pick, on the, pick the speck out of that person's eye, take the plank out of your own eye. It's a very New Testament thing. Before we're going to deal with confronting other people and their sin, which Moses is going to be doing here, we're going to deal with ourselves first. We're going we're to deal with ourselves first. Before you, you know, like that person out there, that, that person, that person is, that person's a pervert. It's a pervert. Let me tell you all about it, says the gossip. Oh, well, gossip, that's, that's, that's an okay sin because I'm not offended by that. Uh, I'm not offended by that. It's not scandalous. That's scandalous. So that's a real sin. The sins, you know, like my sins, they're not a big deal. Um, I only have the offensive, highly offensive to God's sins of pride and detesting, detestable gossip. And I'm, I'm just kind of mean sometimes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a jerky face. And so that's, that, that's just part of, that's just, that's okay. Because I'm, I'm not, I don't have a scandalous sin. We, we've, arra we've arranged our own or arrayed ourselves on our own sins that theirs are the bad ones and, and ours are not quite so big of a, big of a deal. Or, or, you know, that's scandalous but mine are secret. So that's, that's better. Or, or theirs are scandalous and, and, and mine, are, mine are just normal, normal ongoing stuff. You know. We can't, we can't let big obedience make us blind or passive about our areas of disobedience. And you, you think about Moses here. He is about to, he's, he's obeying. He's doing this major obedience thing kind of against what he wants to do. He, he, is, he, is, he is like, he's leaving his home. He doesn't want to leave his home. And he's obeying God, and yet still God wants to confront him about some ongoing sin in his life that has been going on ever since his son was eight days old. And it's been ongoing, but now along the way, all of a sudden, he, it's going to be confronted. And we can, we can be so blinded if we're obeying God in, the, in certain ways. If, if we're doing big things for God, if we're, we're generally a good person in all these ways. And, and then we can be very tolerant, self-gracious, and, and apathetic about the, the existence of, of, of compromises and sin in our lives. If we're obeying, if it feels balanced, like we're doing more good than, than sin. Moses ought to have circumcised his son on the eighth day. And now he's off to do God's will in this big way, but God confronts him about the ongoing disobedience in this other part of his life uh, as he's on his way to do God's big work of rescuing the people. The second heart check question is this. Am I letting obedience in one area cause apathy about obedience in other areas? Cause, cause apathy about obedience in other areas. You could also be asking yourself, you know, like, have I, have I rated my sin as not a big deal? Things that God thought were such a big deal, he put down in his book several times on different pages. Well, yeah. Something like that. That's just for fun. Uh, so the, that's the, second, the second thing is that the context is pointing out what's going on here. The first thing is notes about circumcision, fun. Uh, the second one was, was that. And then the third piece in our passage here is, um, and I highlighted this as we were reading it through, there's no names in this, in this bizarre story paragraph. It, it, doesn't say, uh, it doesn't say, on the trip at an overnight campground, it happened that the Lord confronted Moses and intended to put Moses to death. Um, the old versions said that. The, the older the translation, the more they would insert in Moses' name into this paragraph. But it's actually not there. It's not in anywhere in this paragraph. It just says him or, or him. And so the question became, who is him? Who is him? Who is the him? And, and, and you know, at first glance, it's like it's Moses. But so people get confused. Why is God sending Moses on a mission and then he's going to put him, Moses to death? Well, it doesn't say he's going to put Moses to death. He's going to put him to death. Who's him? Now scholars are like, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Actually, is the him his son, the, the firstborn son, in light of the last context there? 
you know, is this, is this Gershom? Uh, is this Gershom? Not, and because it seems to be more and more likely, the more things are studied, that they're taking Moses' name out very intentionally. And they're not going to add his son's name in because it's actually not there either. But they're just getting it back, um, back more to, to the original. Verse 23 ends with saying, God saying, look, I'm about to kill your firstborn son. Verse 24, the Lord confronted him to put him to death. It's, it's, they're thinking, okay, this is actually way more probably about Gershom than actually putting Moses to death. Now, it, there's a really important test here, a heart check moment here. And the thing is, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but it's kind of one or, one or the other. I've got two in my mind, but, but depending on the why, uh, it, it, that's, that's going to lean us to which is the right heart check moment. But, but they're both good. And I'll, uh, the thing is, I don't understand the unstated why here. Why wasn't Moses' firstborn son circumcised? Why wasn't he circumcised? Why is there disobedience here? It's either his fault or her fault. <laughs> it's probably both. But, le- but let's just say, it, if it's his fault, that leads us to one, one conclusion, one lesson. If it's her fault, it leads us to another. Let me track them through. They're, they're both good lessons. Let's say, it's, let's say it's her fault, Zipporah. Let's say Zipporah is the reason that Gershom's not circumcised. Seems pretty likely. If not Zipporah, her family, where, who they're living with. They're living with um, her father, who is a priest, maybe even the high priest, of, the, of Midian, the nation, and it's maybe Moses is in this family, he's been brought into this family, and he has these kids, and he wants to respect, maybe, the, the, the honor, obey the culture, the values of this family, of this, this family who the, the patriarch is a priest here, that he's living in and that he's, been, that he's been brought into his home and allowed to marry into his home. And so he wants to honor this culture and values. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, uh, I don't know if this is exactly it, but uh, it could be her. It could be, uh, sorry, it could be her, her as the reason, or it could be Moses as the reason. And what would be Moses being the reason? Well, maybe after the age of 40, when Moses murders the Egyptian, and he has to run for his life, uh, maybe he just gets to that point, probably likely, where he just feels like he feels like he just failed. He just failed God. God in Acts chapter 7, we know that Moses knew that he was supposed to be rescuing the people, and he blew it. He crashed the bird. He had the biggest failing of his life. He failed God, and now he's in a different country with no thought to ever go back. I don't know if you've ever blown it so much with God previously in your life, and, and you've gone through a season of feeling rather not zealous to be particularly obedient in every little thing. Because you failed God, you're like, why, why bother? Why try? M- maybe it's Moses there. I-, I don't know what the more likely reason is. It, maybe it's both a bit, or, or maybe it's or her. Or, but, but each of these has an important uh, faith lesson for us, a, a heart check lesson for us. If the issue is Zipporah or her family, and, and she and her family were opposed to Hebrew circumcision, practices of, of circumcising a baby at, at eight days old in, in the Hebrew way, then the lesson that we need to take away here, number three, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, am I obeying God even when my spouse, parents, family, culture, or anything pressures me to not obey? And those pressures are strong. Those pressures are strong. Maybe Zipporah wants to wait to circumcise their kids for until a couple of days, a couple of weeks before they get married, or you know. And the thought is, it's still going to happen. It's just a little compromise. It's just timing. We're still going to get there. Uh, or maybe Zipporah wants them circumcised with a different kind of the Midianite circumcision as, as opposed to the the, the Jewish one. Uh, Maybe that's what's going on. Every week before preaching, I, I, I tell you the most important thing. And when I say that, you're thinking, yes, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart. But that's not where it starts. It starts with, hero Israel, the Lord our God. Uh, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. God alone is our God. Like, alone. And there's so many things in our life that vie for that first place. Um, uh, when, when her, Kelly and I's realtor, when we were buying a house uh, in, in, when we were kids, uh, uh, his line was, happy wife, happy life, right? And, and just that, that it just, 
it's true, but it's also not supposed to be in the first place, right? That, that, that sense of, okay, I want uh, my wife to be happy, that would be putting her in the first place. I want to follow God alone and his, his priorities in, in my life. Uh, caring about what other people think about you. Sometimes that drives everything. It drives so many decisions, and you veer away from things because of pressure and what other people will think if you make this decision or if you say no to this or if you say yes to this or if you go this direction in your life or um, things that our culture might think or value and think that this is, this is better, and so we want to bend on the words of God or bend away from what God would exactly want us to do because our culture says, you know, it's okay and, and all that sort of stuff. Usually before God uh, wants to do big things through us, he wants to make sure that we are committed to him, uh, committed to obeying him over anyone else. Or everything else. And so often we get tested in this before, before God gives us big tasks to, to do because God wants to know, will I care more about what other people think or about what he wants done? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, he says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. It's that same sort of idea. What's in first place? What, what my parents think or my spouse thinks. That could be what's going on with Moses here. With why his son wasn't circumcised on the eighth day. Now, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for that reason, uh, again, maybe it's because, maybe it's because Moses, Moses felt like he'd, he'd failed. And he failed. And so maybe what's going on in this story is Zipporah is like, okay, my husband doesn't care about doing what God wants, but it's gone on for so long, and now there's threat against my son, and I'm going to step in. I really don't see it this way particularly, but, but, but maybe. And, and so she's going to step in. Uh, for Her husband has failed in his leadership, and, and she's going to circumcise her, her son, even though Moses hadn't done it yet, probably Moses is restraining his son. Uh, it's hard to imagine this being the exact scenario. But from, but from Zipporah's perspective, the heart check question could be, am I championing obedience in my home even if others are against it? Still a good heart check question. Am I championing obedience in my home even if others are against it? The New Testament talks a lot about complicated relationships. Situations where a husband or a wife, usually it's the wife in the New Testament, um, is a believer and then the other spouse isn't a believer. And that's really complicated, the honoring, love, and yet following God in that context. Or like a, a slave is, is a believer and the, the master is, is evil or, or something like that. It's very complicated. The, the New Testament talks about very complicated uh, relationship situations and tries to teach us how to follow God well in all those in all those moments. Uh, you know, maybe maybe Zipporah is just stepping in and like, okay, it's time for obedience and it's past time and, and now this is a really traumatic moment, scary moment. Either way, those are common ways where God tests our hearts often to see if we're committed to Him more than anyone else or anything else. I remember when Jesus asked me, and I've talked about this a lot, um, when Jesus asked me to give away half our savings a long time ago. I mean, I remember walking home thinking, what is Kelly going to think about this? What is she going to say? <laughs> Luckily, praise God, she was like, yeah. Uh, it shocked me. I, I was like, who, who responds that way? But yeah, she, she was like, yeah. Um, it, it kind of back to the, like, I delight to do your will, oh God. Like, that was Kelly's attitude uh, towards God that day. I was really uh, impressed. And... And yet I've thought often, what would I have done if she would have been like, no. Not just no, but no. <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and I was like, and if I was like, okay, God, uh, I think God wants me to give away half my savings. My wife says, no. Yeah, tricky. Tricky. God wants to know often who's, who's in the first place. And he often t tests our heart before we take that big, go into the big stuff moments. We have those God moments, one-on-one, -on -one, heart check moments, and then, the, and then step out with him. But reawakening begins here. One, one um, historical, one note here about the passage. Um, this might be the moment, this is the most likely moment where Moses and Zipporah part ways for a while. Uh, likely, we know that they will eventually, because we know that when Moses leads the people out of Egypt, and they go through the Red Sea, then Jethro comes 
out to meet him and greet him and brings his wife Zipporah and his kids with them to meet up with Moses. This seems like the very likely moment where they go different directions, either because um, Gershom needs to heal, <laughs> and so they're going to wait a little bit around here. They haven't left Midian yet. I'll show you that in a second, but they haven't left Midian yet, so they're not very far away. And um, maybe Moses and Zipporah, after reading this paragraph, maybe they just need some space. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like a pretty traumatic moment here, right? Where they thought it was going to be safe to go back. You know, we heard that everybody wanted to kill Moses is dead, so let's all go back together. Oh, actually, that was really scary. So they might have split directions here. Let me just finish reading the last couple of verses of this chapter and, and wrap up chapter 4. It says this in verse 27. Now, now the Lord Yahweh had said to Aaron, go and meet Moses in the wilderness. So he went and met him at the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, also count Mount Horeb, Horeb, also where the burning bush was, also in Midian. So Moses, again, has not left Midian yet on this journey. Uh, met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Moses, and Moses told Aaron everything Yahweh the Lord had sent him to say and about all the signs he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the Israelites. Aaron repeated everything Yahweh the Lord had said to Moses and performed the signs before the people. I'm about to read three words that don't appear much in the Bible. The people believed. The people believed. I mean, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. The people believed, and, and when they heard that the Lord had paid attention to them and that he had seen their misery, they knelt low and, and worshipped. Okay, it's not going to all be smooth and easy, but this is a good moment. This is going to be a, a good move. After Moses has his God moment, him and God, after he has his heart check moment, and they start now moving out of the face, uh, faith, uh, doing what God wants them to do, God seems to be blessing this moment, and, he, and he's in this moment. And, and then there's this favor as they reconnect, as he reconnects with his brother, and as he reconnects with the leaders, and, and people believe. They, they believe, and they, they step out with him. The, the question that I have for you is... If God wanted to use you in this time, this is a very opportune moment. Uh, upheaval moments in, in the history of the world are wide open spiritual door moments. Uh, there, there's, there's so much that's not normal. H have you noticed that, that, uh, <laughs> that church isn't normal? Uh, right now, have you noticed that people are wearing masks uh, and, and walking around? Have you noticed that, uh, that people are, we're, we're not allowed to meet in our homes right now in Glasgow this week uh, with, with other households? I mean, it is not normal. And, and during times of upheaval and uncertainty and what's going to happen with the jobs and money and all this kind of stuff, then people are more open to hearing about God. If God was going to use you right now to make a difference in someone's life, to be the, the person sent to give the word of encouragement, to be the person sent sent to, give, to, to pray and, and to ask God's intervention in their finances. If God was to send you to be that person that would, that would spur them to hope and tell them about Jesus and that there's, there's more to this life than luck and chance, but there is a God who is paying attention and who loves you. If God was going to use you right now in, in a way, before he, before he leads you that direction, what might he want to look at in your heart? What heart check would he be asking you right now? Would he ask you about your passion? Do you want to do that? If I asked you to, to, to go out and, and give this person hope and tell them about Jesus, is, is, it, is that is your desire to do that, if that's what I want you to do? Um, w would he be like, okay, before we go and, and do this, you know, let's get, is there some sin stuff that he'd be wanting to confront uh, in, in your life? Things that maybe should have been addressed by now. Or would he uh, be testing your heart on, on, on the pressures from others? I don't want to tell this person because what will they think of me? Or I don't want to challenge this because they'll, they might think this or, or, or whatever. What would God test your heart on in this moment if, if he was going to use you in this moment to bring about some reawakening in someone else's life? The, the, the challenge for today is, is this. If, if God was going to highlight something for you to address before taking your next step forward, what do you think he would call out? Now, this is not a guilt moment. Uh, I have no idea what's in your mind. Um, this is a, 
maybe some conviction moment. This is a good moment for the Holy Spirit to bring conviction. But, but this, I also want to remind you that this is not in condemnation. This is in the context of uh, invitation inviting you to more and closer and deeper you're surrounded if you've given your life to jesus in grace and forgiveness and love this is happening in this context and you've got this grace forgiveness and love surrounding you and and you're being invited to take a step closer in your in your walk with jesus and to get something or some things sorted in your heart to to walk more and more in step with jesus don't think of this as some some guilt moment think of this as an opportunity moment to to move closer to Jesus and, and to, uh, to walk with him. In fact, let me pray that over us as, as we think about this. Um, would you close your eyes? God, F God I, I, uh, Father, I am so thankful for your spirit. I'm so thankful for your love. I'm so thankful for your grace. I'm so thankful for your forgiveness. I'm so thankful that there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. I thank you that, that the guilt is taken away, that our sin is atoned for. And yet I think that, I, I praise you that in all of this, you still convict and you highlight things. And, and God, I thank you that you're highlighting things even to those who are listening. Things to adjust, things to shift, things that you want to be addressed either passion or passionate, passionless stuff or, or, or sin or, or, or whatever. God, and I, I thank you for that. Now, God, I pray that you would, you would help us all um, pass our heart checks right now and, and take our steps closer to you and then use us, use us in, in a big way to have a big impact in this, in this moment, um, this opportune moment in our city, in our world today. God, we look to you.